good evening. Looks like I'm having the Ashby effect. I'm scaring people off. And uh, for those of you who aren't aware of this running joke on my shirt, uh, Anthony said he knew a fellow that, that was a preacher. And he said during every sermon he would at least say in conclusion three times to give the listeners hope. So, uh, so that's what we're doing here this, uh, this evening. Okay, I'm going to ask uh, Brother Ashby, if you would, to uh, read uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God be merciful to me a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Thank you. Now, Russ Barnes on Wednesday night has been doing a great job of showing us that how we can become so familiar with Bible stories and passages that we no longer can hear them, and thus we can no longer learn anything from them. And I think this uh, exemplifies that problem, this uh, story of the Pharisee and the tax collector. If you really want to insult a Christian, call him or her a Pharisee. Christians recoil at the term Pharisee. But that's because we see Pharisees from this side of the cross. But the original hearers of Jesus' message didn't view the Pharisees that way. To his original hearers, the Pharisees were wonderful. They were the guardians of scripture and oral tradition. And unlike their theological cousins, the higher brow Sadducees, they were working class folk, middle class, and were closer to and more loved by the common person. If you want to have a parallel today of what a Pharisee might be, you can think of an elder or a deacon in your typical Church of Christ. Someone who loves God, they're well respected, they understand the scriptures, and they are devoted servants. Now the, fair, the tax collectors, on the other hand, were a completely different story. <laughs> Living under Roman rule, they, the, the Romans took certain Jews to become tax collectors, and it's a known fact inside the Bible and outside the Bible, in the vernacular of the peasantry, that tax collectors were scumbags. <laughs> they would extort money from their own people just to line their own pockets. To get a feel for how they were viewed, this image helps, but also if you've ever seen some World War II Movies like Casablanca, where France was under uh, Nazi occupation and they had people that were collaborating against the French with the Nazis. And you'd find them in alleys making passing notes or making phone calls late at night, all the time undermining their own country while benefiting themselves. So we have this scene that Jesus paints of this wonderful Pharisee, very respected, standing all alone in the temple, certainly by design. And all eyes were probably on this very pious, well-respected, middle-class Jewish citizen. And he raises his arms, raises his head, and he opens his mouth and begins to pray. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, 
adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all that I receive. I couldn't help but paraphrase. God, what a wonderful human being I am. I almost can't even stand myself. <laughs> I'm so much better than these reprobates around me. All the disgusting kinds of things they do, I will have none of it. Drinking, smoking weed, raising ill-mannered children, cheating on their spouses, sleeping around, getting abortions. I want to puke. Just look at me, God. Can you find any fault with me? Look hard, for you know you won't. And not only am I much more moral than they, in that I don't get involved in these things they get involved in, but I'm also proactive in my do-goodery. I'm always volunteering to help those less fortunate than I, I go to church twice every Sunday. When Wednesday night rolls around, you know where you can find me. I'll be in a Bible class soaking up your word, not sitting at home on a couch watching all the filth on TV, Netflix, or Amazon. I'm always praying and reading my Bible. Oh, Lord, how majestic is my name in all the earth. And contrast that with the tax collector. Huddled off in some far off corner, knowing how the people in the temple felt about him, and rightfully so. And surely he saw the Pharisee when he came in, standing by himself, hands lifted to God, and looking askance at him with disdain and disgust. And so the tax collector, unlike the Pharisee, won't even look up to heaven. But he beats his breast, which was a cultural sign of extreme contrition, and utters one simple phrase, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, the English translations usually have a sinner, but in the Greek, and I looked it up so as not to make a total fool of myself, it is actually, have mercy on me, the sinner. Now put yourself in the shoes of those who heard Jesus for the first time telling this parable. They would fully be expecting Jesus to come down with both feet on the ungodly tax collector and sing the praises of this wonderful, upright, moral Pharisee. But as Jesus does so very often, he turns things completely around against all expectation. He proclaims the tax collector justified and the Pharisee condemned. But why? First, I want you to notice that there is not a hint in Jesus' telling of this parable that implies what the Pharisee was saying about himself was false. Everything he was saying was true. He was an upright and moral man. He was respected in the community. But it was this Pharisee's prayer that lay bare his heart. And it is the heart of the Pharisee that God was paying attention to. Most of you know that I was converted in Gainesville, Florida, in the Crossroads Church of Christ. By anyone's definition, a cult. Because of my zeal and hard work in that group, I was becoming a rock star. They had what you call a bring your neighbor day, and I once brought nine people to it, filled the entire front row. That was a feat that was unheard of at the time. I prayed constantly for a long, long time. I had tons of people come to Bible studies. And if that door at that crossroads church was open, you could find John Camp inside somewhere. Now, I'm stunningly handsome today, but when I was in my 20s, <laughs> when I was in my 20s, I was quite average looking. But, <laughs> but 
But because of my zeal and my status in the congregation, I could ask out the most beautiful women in there, and they'd jump at the chance to go out with me. I was a hot commodity. One evening, I passed by a small van, and it said such and such Church of Christ on the side of it. As I walked away from the van, I, sh I was shaking my head and muttering to myself, those poor lost souls. I didn't know anybody from that congregation. I didn't know where that congregation was. But I knew that the clowns in that church, there wasn't one of them working as hard for or loving God as much as I was. A few years ago, we had our, our garage flood had something to do with the water heater, and I know nothing about such things, so I had to call somebody to come and take a look at it. He told me it was the water heater. But I had to take a bunch of boxes out of this one room, and in one of these boxes were some letters I had written to Donna early on in our relationship. I was literally in the room by myself and embarrassed to read what I was reading. I had no recollection of those letters, and I couldn't believe how absolutely condescending I was to her and self-righteous and puffed up and how she could ever marry the jerk that wrote those letters. <laughs> I have no idea. Was I a Pharisee? Was I like the Pharisee, looked up to by others? Absolutely. Was I like the Pharisee, a do-gooder? Yes, I was. Was I like the Pharisee, Condemned by God, you better believe I was. People who know absolutely nothing about the Bible know this passage, John 3.16. If you watch any sporting event on TV, you'll see the sign hanging all over the place. And Tim Tebow, when he played college ball, he used to look just like that on game day. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. If there is one thing the Bible makes clear over and over again, it is that our do-goodery, our moral uprightness, cannot justify us before a perfect, loving God. The only justification we have is found kneeling at the cross of Christ with the attitude of heart, Lord, have mercy on me, the sinner. Self-righteousness is a very, very subtle and deceptive thing. It is so easy to compare ourselves to others around us and begin to feel justified in the eyes of God, just like the Pharisee. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things, and it is exceedingly corrupt. Who can understand it? Years ago, I saw a documentary where this fellow was interviewing two death row inmates. These two men were on death row for killing a family of five, a mother and father, and three young children. They killed them in the most heinous fashion. One took a pen, an ink pen that you write with, put it in one of the child's ears, and hammered it into his brain to kill him. <coughs> During the interview, the fellow doing the interview said, well, what about this guy over here? Why does everybody stay away from him? Why is he protected by the guards? And one of the men says, oh, if any of us ever get hold of him, he's dead. And the guy said, well, what in the world did he do? And the fellow said, he killed his mother. So the fellow doing the interview was taken aback and he said, you two killed five innocent people, including three children. And the one man said, yes, we did. But they were strangers to us. This man killed his own mother, and there's a difference. Now, from our perspective, we look at that and we think, how absurd to quibble over a subtle difference like that. But that is precisely what we do when we put on our Pharisee hat, gown, and tassel. 
For you see, the reality is that we are all prison inmates. And from God's perfect perspective, when we look down on others, we're doing the exact same thing these two prison inmates were doing to that one man. We are quibbling over distinctions that God does not make. Have I ever killed anyone? Yes. Because I have hated. Have I ever committed adultery? Yes. Because I have desired to. Hebrews chapter 4. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are laid naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Just how depraved are we human beings? How much ugliness truly does lie within? Ironically, the longer I've been a Christian, I have found more ugliness in my heart and not less. Perhaps you've heard the story of the Donners. This was in the 1800s. This group of settlers were going from Missouri or Kansas and going to California. Due to some bad logistics, they got caught in the Sierra Nevadas during the worst winter recorded. They were stuck there for four months. All the cattle was gone. To survive, they were, they were boiling saddles to get some kind of sustenance from the, from the saddles. And eventually, they started eating one another. This one lady, Tamsin Donner, who was the matriarch of the entire crew, she wrote in her diary, we're beginning to eat one another. My husband and I have committed ourselves. That is never going to happen. We will die first. About two weeks later, she, her husband, and their three children cooked and ate her husband's brother. The heart is deceitful above all things. She had no idea she had that capability. Some of you know who Chuck Colson is. He was part of the Watergate hearings. He got convicted. He did a couple years in prison. He became converted in prison, came out, lived many years of uh, life serving Jesus. He died not too many years ago. In his book, The Body, he wrote the following. In 1960, Israeli undercover agents orchestrated the daring kidnapping of one of the worst of the Holocaust masterminds, Adolf Eichmann. Now, I saw that trial, part of it, when I was 10 years old. And I'll never forget the judge asked Eichmann after all the hideous things he had seen and done and managed if he had any regrets. And I'll never forget through his interpreter, he said, regrets are for children. After capturing him in his South American hideout, they transported him to Israel to stand trial. There, prosecutors called a string of former concentration camp prisoners as witnesses. One was a small, haggard man named Yehil Denyer, who had miraculously escaped death in Auschwitz. On his day to testify, Denyer entered the courtroom and stared at the man in the bulletproof glass booth. The man who had murdered his friends, personally executed a number of Jews, and presided over the slaughter of millions more. As the eyes of the two men met, victim and murderous tyrant, the courtroom fell silent, filled with the tension of the confrontation. But no one was prepared for what happened next. Yehil Denyer began to shout and sob, collapsing to the floor. Was he overcome by hatred, by the horrifying memories, by the evil incarnate in Eichmann's face? No. As he later explained in a riveting 60 Minutes interview, it was because Eichmann was not the demonic personification of evil he had expected. Rather, he was an ordinary man, just like anyone else. 
And in that one instant, Denyer came to the stunning realization that sin and evil are the human condition. I was afraid about myself, Denyer said. I saw that I am capable to do this exactly like he. Denyer's remarkable statements caused Mike Wallace to turn to the camera and ask the audience the most painful of all questions. How is it possible for a man to act as Eichmann acted? Was he a monster, a madman, or was he perhaps something even more terrifying? Was he normal? Yehil Denyer's shocking conclusion, and I quote, Eichmann is in all of us. There we go. So who are you? The Pharisee or the tax collector? All of humanity is divided into those two. If you're a Christian in this room, no matter how moral or upright, if you are relying on your own goodness before God to be justified, you are the Pharisee. If you are not a Christian, then you are declaring that the cross of Christ is of no consequence to you, and thus declaring yourself justified before God on your own merit, and thus the Pharisee. If you're a Christian Pharisee, you need to repent and humble yourself before God. And if you're a non-Christian Pharisee, you need to kneel at the cross and from the heart utter the words, Lord, have mercy on me, the sinner. Confess Jesus as Lord, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and begin to walk in newness of life. And if we can help you in any way to do this, please come. Please come.